Hello my dear listener and welcome to our channel. The phone rang, and I answered. There was an order for a soup. The caller on the other end said the husband was a former Marine who served in Afghanistan. He had seen and done too much and was now suffering from PTSD. His wife had invited her lover to stay at their home, and she had been rubbing it in her husband's face. Poor man gets a panic attack every time he confronts them. He doesn't want to go to jail, he just wants to deal with the lover himself. As for the wife, she's the main culprit in this story, and he wants to handle her personally. Even though the husband seems afraid, I'll still take the job. A few days later, I met James. He was a nice guy. I never really understood PTSD before, but I now had a clearer idea of why he allowed his wife to cuckold him. He was afraid of his own rage. He didn't want to kill anymore. He said he'd had enough of that in Afghanistan. I wished him luck. A few hours later, a gagged and tied lover boy named Donnie was stuffed into a hidden compartment of the 18-wheeler I was driving. I drove the truck to Rio Grande. From there, I put him in a bag and took him to the river, where a small boat was waiting to take me to my destination. The sky was clear and it was a full moon. I could see the stars, and it seemed like they were traveling with me. I closed my eyes and drifted back in time, my life, my parents, my friends, my little sister, my wife, Guamachil, Kaloa, Mexico. I was born here in 1964. My parents were Rita Lopez Montoya and Salvador Mesa. As a kid, I wasn't the smartest, but I was hardworking from the start. I never went to high school, but I was skilled. My dad taught me how to work hard. I started working as a kid, making bricks and later learning how to use them to build. I became a small bricklayer. The 80s in Mexico were wild. There were heroes who fought the corrupt government and helped the poor, Miguel and Hell, Felix Gardo, LGF, the boss of the bosses, El Chapo, the Ariano Felix brothers. It was the golden era of the cartels. The government was either filled with money or riddled with bullets. I, on the other hand, was just a poor man with the desire to live, make some money, get married, have some kids, and eventually die. Oh. I guess I didn't tell you my name, Sanago Mesa Lopez. They also know me as the ELO, meaning the stew maker, which is what I'm most famous for. By the way, I love posel, pork shoulders slowly cooked with vegetables. Slowly is the key word here. I married Chelly when I was 21 years old. She was a knockout, curly hair, brown eyes, a sharp nose, small lips, and a body to die for. She was like a young Sahayak. Life was fine, it was a struggle but good. I had everything I wanted and never thought I would end up where I am today. One fine morning, my lovely wife asked, when do we move to the big city? I don't want to stay in the village. All my friends are there. All your friends got divorced after moving to the city, some are working as hookers, some have returned, and two have disappeared. I heard the two are now working for the cartel as pleasure women. So after hearing this, you still want to go? I asked, just because they made mistakes and wrecked their lives doesn't mean that I will have the same fate. After all, I want to go with you. Will you not come with me? She said with a sad face. I'll think about it, but I can't promise anything, I said, and I left for the construction site. I wasn't sure why she suddenly started this discussion, but I didn't like it. I had a family to take care of, my parents and my little sister, Nina. I couldn't just leave it all behind. There are things we want to do, but sometimes they never happen. Instead, what happens is the total opposite of what we want. It may be for the best or for the worst. For me, it was both. In 1992, my parents fell ill, and I needed money, so I had to rush to the city to find a better job. Tijuana, Baja California, a big city, lots of people, very few jobs for a bricklayer. I used to find menial jobs during the day and at night, tried to lay down to sleep and avoid getting robbed. I returned to Guamachil after a month. As I walked in, I saw my sister with red eyes and a sad face. 
she informed me that both my parents had died a week after I left, and they had no way to contact me. I was sad, but it was part of life. They were getting old and were going to die anyway. I toughened up and continued with my life. I went back to Tijuana a week later and, this time, had some success. I was getting work every day. I thought my life was going to get better. I woke up every morning at 4 a.m. and went searching for work. By 7 a.m., most of the work I got involved bricklaying or loading goods onto trucks, and if I was lucky, I might get to work with a big-time mason. It was at a small store that I first met Teodoro, who would later be known as El Teo. Teodoro Garcia Cemental was a guy who helped load goods onto trucks. Sometimes, friendships can form from the most unlikely circumstances, and that's what happened with us. I used to load goods for him, and he paid me well. One day, he offered me a beer. No one had ever offered me anything before. A few weeks later, he took me with him. Where are we going? I asked. Time to upgrade, buddy. We're going to get rich. A few minutes later, we arrived outside a big house, and I saw two heavily armed men standing outside. I got out of the truck and looked at the gate. Teodoro pointed towards it and said, Take a step, buddy. We're going to be rich. I'm not sure what happened at that moment. All I could hear was my heartbeat, which was telling me to run away and never look back. I stood frozen for three seconds, and then everything went silent. I took the first step and walked through the gates. It was a small step for me, but a giant leap for mankind. Whether it was for good or bad, I'll never judge. Teodoro took me to another man in the big house. I don't really recall his name, but he was a tall guy wearing a cowboy hat and white cowboy boots, with a pistol tucked under his belt. Teodoro then walked with this man and asked me to wait. He spoke to another man who was sitting by the pool. A few minutes later, he came back to me and said, From tomorrow, you will live here, take care of the horses, and make sure that any masonry work that needs attention is done promptly. I nodded. The very next day, as I walked back to the big house, I was stopped at the gate and searched. I walked in and went to the big man I met the day before. He showed me a small room at one end of the house and told me I could stay there. That day, I tended to the horses, giving them hay and water, and made sure they were washed and brushed. There was no work in the house that evening. When I was in my room, the big man came and sat beside me. What is your name? he asked. Santiago Mesa Lopez. I'm from Guamachol. I'm Ricardo. I'm from Luna Bagu. There are some rules I need to tell you about. You will never walk inside the house. You will never take the horses out of the compound. You may see a lot of things that might make you unhappy or even question your presence here. Close your eyes and return to your room. Just lay down and never talk to anyone outside the house. Do I make myself clear? I nodded, and the man got up and started walking away. I have a question, I said, stopping him. Who do I work for? I mean, who is the owner here? He looked back at me and said, Eduardo Ariano Felix. I had heard that name before and immediately knew who he was. Eduardo is one of the nephews of the founder of the Gore Cartel, Miguel Angel Felix Gardo. Eduardo and his brothers are known as the Ariano Felix brothers. They founded the Tijuana Cartel. I thought I had bitten off more than I could chew. A few weeks went by with nothing significant happening. I never saw anything that made me feel I was working for the devil. After a month of working there, I wanted to go back to my village and see my family. Ricardo allowed me to go back, and I also asked if I could stay with my wife somewhere nearby. Fortunately, he agreed and said he would arrange a small house nearby. So, I was on my way to bring my family to the big city. A week later, I brought my wife to the new small house, about half a mile from the big house. My wife and sister were both very happy and excited to see the city. I wanted to have kids now, but it seemed that God did not want me to have children. After trying for months, we realized something was not right. We had a heated exchange one night. Araceli, 
I know how much having a baby means to you, and it's important to me too, but right now the financial strain is overwhelming. I wish I could just snap my fingers and make it happen, but reality is tough. I know we've been trying for a baby, but the checkup costs are just too high right now. That's your excuse every time. Do you even realize how much this means to me? I've been waiting for us to start a family, and all I hear from you are excuses, she sneered. I'm not making excuses, Araceli. I'm telling you the reality of our situation. We have bills to pay, and I can't just magically make money appear out of thin air. Well, maybe if you worked harder or got a better job, we wouldn't be in this mess. I'm doing the best I can. Right now, this is the only job I have. Fine, Lopez. Do whatever you want, but don't expect me to wait around forever while you drag your feet on something that's so important to me. I'm not dragging my feet. I'll figure out a way to save up for the checkups, but I need your support, not your constant nagging. We did not speak to each other that night. I started saving money, which put a lot of strain on our family. I wanted my daughter to go to school, but that wasn't possible right now. She was already 19 years old, and I needed to get her trained in some skill set so she could have a better life. A few days later, something unusual happened. Two men arrived at the big house. They were not Americans but looked like they belonged in a fancy office, not here. They seemed relaxed, talking to the guards as if it were no big deal. They knew where they were going, nodding at people as if they belonged. I waited, expecting something exciting, but they just talked to the boss and said some things I didn't understand. I kept my distance. The next day, while I was with the horses, I received an unexpected summons to the back of the house. There was a small room there, and I was asked to go in. As I entered, I found the two men engrossed in a peculiar experiment. They had prepared a solution that looked like clear water. They asked me to lower a beef leg into a metal drum. I picked up the beef leg and placed it in the drum. Then Teodoro walked in. They asked me to pour the liquid into the drum and stir it for hours. I diligently stirred the concoction, intrigued by its purpose yet unaware of its true nature. It wasn't until two hours later that the mystery unraveled before my eyes. The beef leg, initially submerged in the solution, had dissolved completely, transforming the liquid into a thick soup. The stench was unbearable. A few minutes later, they asked me to drain the drum. When I drained it, I found tiny fragments of bone and some foul-smelling liquid. The two men smiled at me and later asked me to come back the next day. For the next two weeks, they kept experimenting with different mixtures and methods to dissolve the beef leg. I learned that they were from Israel. Finally, they settled on caustic soda and water. It took time, but it was the most cost-effective and efficient method to dissolve meat. To my surprise, I was given $500 for my work with the two Israeli men. Filled with excitement, I decided to leave work early, eager to share the news with Araceli. For so long, we had struggled with fertility issues, and the constant disappointment had weighed heavily on us. As I stepped into our home, I was met with a sight that shattered my world. There, in our own bedroom, Araceli was with another man, and the scene left no room for doubt or misunderstanding. My heart sank as I stood frozen in the doorway, overwhelmed by shock disbelief, and profound pain. How could this be happening? My mind struggled to grasp the reality of the situation. It felt like a nightmare. Driven by raw emotion, I charged at the man, fists clenched. I landed a few punches, fueled by a desperate need to defend my honor. But the man was skilled and retaliated swiftly, dodging my blows and countering with precise strikes that threw me off balance. Despite my determination, I was no match for his strength. The fight was chaotic, a whirlwind of desperation and fury. I tried to keep my guard up, but each blow landed with brutal force, driving me to the ground. The pain was intense, but my anger refused to let me surrender. However, it soon became clear that I was outmatched. The man loomed over me, delivering each blow with calculated precision. You're just a fool, he spat between punches. Thought you could play tough guy? 
you're nothing but a nuisance, and we don't tolerate pests. His words struck hard, underscoring my helplessness against the cartel's power. As the beating continued, his accomplice joined in, adding to the relentless assault. Through the haze of pain, I heard him sneer, your wife, she's mine now. You're lucky I don't finish you off right here, but don't worry, I'll be back. I tried to look at Araceli, she was looking away, seemingly indifferent. You think you've suffered enough? He taunted, his voice dripping with malice. You have no idea about your sister. She's already been used by others. I had my way with her, and now she's working for me. In my fury, I attempted to grab him again, but someone struck me from behind, and I lost consciousness. When I woke up, Ricardo and Teodoro were standing nearby. Ricardo placed a hand on my shoulder. Are you okay? Okay might be an understatement, I replied. I've been better. It's been a nightmare. It's been a nightmare, I said. I confronted that guy from the cartel, and things escalated quickly. What happened? Tell me clearly, Teo asked. I found Araceli with another man. When I tried to intervene, he and his goons beat me up pretty badly. Ricardo clenched his jaw. Did they say anything? Give any indication of what they want? Yeah, they made it clear that I should stay out of their business, especially when it comes to Araceli. They said she belongs to him and that he'd come back later. And he boasted about my sister being forced into some kind of work for them. What about your wife? Teo asked. She was concerned when we came to check on you, although she didn't inform the cops or call a doctor for you. I guess she was willingly involved with the guy, I said. Yes, she was moaning like a witch when I came in. She was enjoying him. Take rest, you have a lot of work to do, Ricardo said, and they both walked out. For the next two days, I stayed in my room at the house and didn't go out. My anger kept boiling and I was concerned for my sister. On the third day, Ricardo came in and asked, Can you walk? I got up and nodded. Follow me, he said and walked out. We went to the experiment lab, where I saw Teo standing. He smiled and said, Rise and shine, boy. Time for you to work your magic. The two guys taught you how to dissolve meat in your magic potion. Can it dissolve human flesh? I was a bit confused and said, with that heat and soda working on it, I guess yes. Suddenly, a voice came from the back. Lopez, you have a choice to make either walk away as a human now or embrace the evil and become the devil. Eduardo Ariano Felix walked in and stood beside me. I now had to make a decision, but then I knew there was no decision to be made. I would never walk out of here alive, let alone as a human. You don't say no to the Felix brothers and stay alive. The only option I had was to become the devil. I became one, and I was determined to be the devil himself. I have a condition, I spoke. Ariano held up his hand. Your sister is still missing. Your wife has left your house, and we expect she is with her new lover, Alvaro Perez, the man who beat you up. He is a leader of a very small cartel, an insignificant human. I will hand him over to you. I was stunned by how he knew what I wanted. I guess that was why he was who he was. I will find the pig and hand him over to you. Do as you please. What about your wife? He asked. The pig was not alone in his act. The swine must pay as well, I said. Let's find your sister first. Let me know when you are ready. I will provide you with an army to hunt that pig down. With his men at my disposal, I combed through every corner of Tijuana, driven by desperate determination to find my missing sister. Days turned into nights, each moment filled with worry and anticipation. Finally, one of the team found her. They received information that fresh meat was delivered to an old man. They raided the place and found seven men in the room, taking turns on Nah. All of them were immediately shot and sent to hell. They informed us and I rushed to the location. As soon as I reached the spot, I ran towards her. Her clothes were torn, bloodied, 
She had bruises on her face, and her eyes were almost swollen shut. My heart sank at the sight of her frail form, barely clinging to life. I had promised to take care of my little sister, and I had failed. I quickly held her in my arms. Nah, I whispered, my voice choked with emotion as I knelt beside her. Her eyes, once full of life, were now hollow and distant, a stark reflection of the horrors she had endured. They did bad things to me. It hurts, she whispered. I could not control my tears as I held her close to my chest. I felt her body go limp. I knew what happened, but my heart could not accept it. I closed my eyes, holding her tight. No, she cannot leave me. My little sister. My little angel. It was silent. I could hear my heartbeat. I don't remember how long I held onto her. I was brought out of my peace by Teo. Cops are coming. We need to go. I carried Na's body and left the place. The next day, Na was laid to rest. Her bruised face still reminded me of the horror and pain she suffered. When her casket was lowered into the ground, something inside me was dying. As her casket was being covered with soil, something inside me was being born. I went back to my room and sat down. A few minutes later, I was called by Teo. I went to meet him. He asked me to follow him. We went to the lab and found a man tied up. He took Na to the old pig. We found him this morning and brought him here, Teo said. I walked to him and sat near him. I'm just a courier guy. Please let me go. It was your wife's plan to sell her and take the money. She is with Alvaro and Sanchez Tabawada. They have five guys with them. Please let me go. I only know this much. You took my sister to hell. You were responsible for her death. A shot rang out, and I saw a hole in his head. Ariana walked in with a smoking pistol. It's time to see if you can make a soup out of this pig, he said. I took the metal drum, added caustic soda, water, and the main ingredient, the pig carcass. I put the drum on the burner, it cooked for 15 hours. I occasionally stirred it. By the end of the 15th hour, all that was left were a few fragments of bones and a large drum filled with a soup that smelled horrible. Ricardo entered the lab and called out, Hey, man, look at this. One of my names is LK, but Teo and Ariano were happy with the results, and that D.L. Pasalo was born. Three days later, Teo called me to a new location, a small building in a deserted area. Welcome to your chicken coo, Teo said. So, this is my office? I asked. We went inside, and Teo said, What do you think? Lavish office. Great location. Only problem will be the travel time. He laughed and added, The traffic is low, so it won't impact your commute. Besides, you get a company-sponsored car. We both laughed and went back to the house. That evening, one of Ariano's men came and said, Time to hunt your pig, Lopez. It's about time, I said to myself and followed him. If there's one place in Tijuana that you don't want to get stuck in, it's Sanchez Tabawada. It's a maze of houses, and you never know from which window that fatal bullet might come. But if you're traveling with a cartel in Tijuana, no one will dare point a finger at you, let alone a metal barrel. Five minutes later, we were looking at a small apartment on the first floor. Three men got out of our entourage and took positions at nearby buildings. Seven others positioned themselves near all exits of the building. There was no way they could escape. Three more men walked into the building with me. We went to the first floor. One of the men knocked on the door. A very intoxicated Alvaro opened it. I raised my pistol and shot him in both his legs. I walked in and saw my wife, naked and hiding behind the bed. Don't worry, my love. I will never lay a hand on you. Just come out and let me talk to you. Please, no. Let me go. Alvaro forced me to do this, she cried. I turned to Alvaro and dragged him by his hair, laying him right next to her. Hey, Alvaro, my wife says you forced her to betray me. 
You forced her to sell my sister. Screw you. He spat at me. I took a chair and sat near him. I placed my index finger in the bullet hole I had made in his leg. I can put another one right between your legs, and I won't use a finger. I have a cannon for that. Now tell me, why did you sell my sister? Your wife is quite the character. I noticed her behavior for a while and couldn't resist. One day, I walked into your house and found her in a compromising situation. It became a regular occurrence. At one point, your sister, Nah, caught us. I was ready to let it go, but your wife insisted that Nah be removed from the equation. That evening, Araceli confided in me that she had drugged Nah. Knowing you were still involved with Felix, I went to your home. Araceli had taken Nah's clothes off and wanted me to help remove Nah somewhere. It was a troubling situation. I later relocated Nah with the help of my associates. Eventually, she ended up with a wealthy man, though I didn't foresee the outcome. Your wife received $1,000 for her involvement. I struck him with the butt of my pistol, knocking him unconscious. I turned to Araceli. No, he's lying. I was forced into this. I aimed my pistol and shot her in the ankle. That ankle will never be the same, and she will never walk properly again, if I let her live that long. Now, my beloved wife, tell me, what did Nah ever do to you that she deserved being dragged through hell? I raised the pistol again. No, please wait. I'll tell everything, she pleaded. I lowered the gun. You were planning to pay for her education. We didn't have money for our expenses, and you were saving for her. You gave her all your attention, and I felt like an afterthought in our home. I hated her, so I orchestrated her removal, she sobbed. At that moment, I was both stunned and furious. Why did you betray me? Alvaro was handsome, fit, and you, on the other hand, are short and not what I desired. I wanted to experience being with someone I found truly appealing, not someone I felt was beneath me. My feelings for you changed. I had reached my limit. I signaled to my men, and both of them were blindfolded, then taken to the truck and driven to the chicken coop. Araceli was left tied up, her blindfold removed, and naked. Alvaro was bleeding and in pain. I took off Araceli's blindfold. She saw the grim setting and began crying. Don't worry, dear. I'll make sure you're well taken care of. I've always cared for you, but the men here have been eager for their turn. I'll give you what you always wanted. You wanted excitement, so I'll ensure you experience it fully. I walked out and told the men, she's all yours. Take your time and invite others if you wish. Three days later, I returned. The men were smiling. As I entered the room, I saw Araceli huddled in a corner, still naked. Someone had bandaged her ankle. There was still a trace of kindness in the world. For a brief moment, I felt a pang of sympathy, but Nas' last words haunted me. Araceli had brought this upon herself. She wanted to be with real men, and now she would understand what that truly meant. I walked out of the room and found my men. It's time. Time to end this. Bring them both to the kitchen and get me a chainsaw. Ten minutes later, the chainsaw roared to life. Afterward, I had two barrels to fill with caustic soda and water. After 16 hours of cooking, I drained the soup for fragments and buried them in the backyard of the chicken coop. In the evening, I went back to the house and collapsed onto the bed. How many husbands walked to the dark side like me? How many can flip the bird to the law and do what they really want to do? How many have the balls to do what I did for them? I would be the sword. I would be the executioner. The boat reached the destination. I dragged Donnie to my chicken coop. My trusted chainsaw was waiting for me, and the drums were eager to cook a new soup for all the husbands who can't walk the walk. I am your devil. I am El Kio. I am El Pasalo. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comment section below, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.